today. So I'm going to talk about um, amphibious construction and how we can use this for heritage sites. Um, I'm at the University of Waterloo in the uh, Department of Architecture, the School of Architecture there. I'm an architect and an engineer, not an archaeologist. And the Buoyant Foundation Project is the uh, nonprofit research association uh, organization that I set up um, 12 years ago to um, uh, for an umbrella for my research team. Um, so my interest in this started with Hurricane Katrina. I was one of three full-time faculty members at the LSU Hurricane Center when Katrina happened. Um, I was there in the capacity of doing uh, wind research. That's part of hurricanes, but Katrina was clearly a flood event and uh, it changed my life and I left LSU to go to the University of Waterloo um, uh, uh, working on, on flood instead of wind. So um, many of you may never have heard of amphibious construction, so let me tell you what it is to get started. Um, so we call it amphibious because it's uh, um, an ordinary building looks like an ordinary building until a flood comes. And it turn, when a flood comes, it turns from a land creature into a sea creature. Um, and so when the flood is there, it floats temporarily uh, and has a vertical guidance system. There's something underneath the house to uh, displace water. Uh, and um, so the house goes up, sits on top of the water, comes back down when the water goes away and lands back in exactly the same place where it took off. We have centering devices to make sure that happens. Um, they've been doing this in the Netherlands for about 20 years, and in the backwoods in Louisiana, I discovered from one of my students at LSU that they've been doing it for more than 40 years. Um, and the people who've been doing that have been, have been my teachers. Um, what I really love about it is that it works with the water doesn't fight the water, doesn't try to control it, lets the water do what the water wants to do. And we are the ones who accommodate the water. Um, so this is an example in the Netherlands. And uh, what we can see here is that there, uh, the houses are in, in long rows, and there's uh, uh, alternating uh, roads of water or canals and, and land roads, and when the uh, level of the lake goes up, um, the land roads uh, are covered with water, they're not used anymore, and uh, people move around in boats on the, on the canals. Um, and this is a more recent complex in Mosbomo in the Netherlands, um, and you can begin to see here how it works. Uh, these are hollow concrete boxes, uh, the houses are sitting on top of those. Um, two houses to a platform. They share the platform, the concrete box is underneath, slab on grade here. And then these are the vertical guidance posts, once in the, one in the front and one in the back. And the platform slides up and down on the, on the posts. Um, and here's an example, ordinary circumstances. And in 2011, there was a, a major flood and the amphibious houses are, are doing their thing. Um, this is uh, a, a new uh, amphibious house uh, in the UK on the River Thames, an island on the River Thames um, uh, in uh, Marlow, Buckinghamshire, and uh, by Baca Architects. Um, and this is the concept. It's a, it's a basement within a basement, a double basement, um, and the uh, outer pit holds back the land and provides the basin for the water to flow into, uh, which then um, allows the house to elevate. Uh, let's go to Louisiana, see what they've been doing there. And this is very, very vernacular. So you can see here, um, this is uh, one of the houses. It's kind of a hybrid. It's a, it was up on, on stilts, but the stilts weren't very tall. So a new owner came in and uh, amphibiated it in addition to the stilts. Um, these are super cheap because the people do it themselves. Um, and it's not engineered. Uh, some of them fail. Uh, and most of them are really awful looking. 
Um, so I like this picture, uh, this pair, because it shows exactly how it works. These are, these are big blocks of EPS, uh, styrofoam, um, with the vertical guidance posts stuck in the ground and a sleeve that comes out from underneath uh, the house and slides up and down. This is a recreational community, um, uh, and so they call these fishing camps. And this is the um, electrical connection, we call these umbilical connections. Uh, and in this context, uh, the people use uh, manual self uh, 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 disconnect for the, the sewer. Um, but we have technology that is a um, uh, self-sealing breakaway for uh, dealing with that that happens absolutely passively. So nobody has to be there to tend to the situation. So here's another one of these uh, little houses. And you can see from the shed in the back that the water is up to about here um, and uh, uh, floating. And then that's more of the context. So in this community, Old River Landing, some of the houses are on stilts and some of the houses are amphibiated. Amphibiation is the noun for making a house amphibious. And I made the word up. And now, <laughs> and, and now it's being used in the field. Um, but. Uh, Oh, I don't want to do that. Okay, so what happens, though, when your flood is deeper than you anticipated? So um, the base flood elevation, defined by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, in the U.S., um, uh, defines base flood elevation is the height above the ground that the lowest part of the first floor structure uh, 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 is. So the, the the lowest part of the first floor structure is about here, and the base flood elevation in this, um, in this area was uh, um, 11 feet, three and a half meters, uh, and they had a five meter flood. And so this is what happened. Here's another one. This was also 2011, the same year as the big flood in, in Mosbommel. Um, and here is an amphibious house on the left and the neighbor on stilts with flood water in the house up to this level. I came back a couple of years later to look at this uh, pair of houses again and what did I find? <laughs> uh, they had uh, uh, followed the example of their resilient neighbor. Um, and so I like this example, it shows very dramatically. That's the five meter flood there. And this really is god awful ugly, but it works. It went up, stayed on top of the water, came back down. And we can do something about the aesthetic. So um, that's not a, 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 a terrible impediment. Um, so there are a lot of, there, uh, there are dozens of these houses there. Um, some look like this. Here's one that's floating. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Buddy Blaylock's house. Most of these, the, the, the houses are occupied seasonally or on weekends for, for uh, fishing trips. Um, but uh, Buddy is one of the few full-time residents. And uh, he built this house in uh, 1982, I believe. Um, he'd been living in the vicinity for 10 years before that and, uh, uh, and, and decided to build his house and live there, live there permanently. Um, and so this was uh, 2011, um, and the house is floating. And take a look at the, uh, the camp next door, uh, because that's our, that's our meter stick. It tells us how high we're floating. So normally, it's up that high. And in the flood, you can see now that the water is up to about here. And Buddy's house just takes it in stride. Uh, this is to remind me to tell you that Buddy um, didn't want to block the beautiful view of the lake from the back side of the house. So he put all four of his vertical guidance posts lined up on the land side so that they wouldn't block his view. And that works just fine. He just needs to be able to slide up and down and not twist, not move side to side or front and back. And uh, you'll see. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, I, uh, this was flooding in uh, uh, last summer, 2017. I went to visit Buddy and uh, took these, these photographs of the, of the context. 
Um, okay, so with this background, I form the Buoyant Foundation Project, and what is different about what I do than um, some of these other things? Well, I work only on retrofit, um, mostly because the reason I started this was out of a, um, a, 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 a desire to address the issue of people in established communities and uh, indigenous people being told by FEMA that they had to move that it was no longer safe for them to continue to live in their communities because of occasional flooding, rare but catastrophic flooding. Well, if we could deal with the consequences of that, then the people wouldn't have to move because the rest of the time, it's a really lovely place to live. And the people have some, for the, for the, for the Native Americans, they've been there for hundreds of years, the, the settlers have still been there for a couple of hundred years and, um, and generations and are very, very, very tied to the place. Um, so um, I work on retrofits for the uh, improve the resilience of existing communities. Um, so what do we do? I basically follow the example of uh, uh, used in Old River Landing, add buoyancy blocks, vertical guidance posts, and then a, a structural subframe to tie everything together. Um, and uh, so these are not a one-size-fits-all solution. There are particular types of houses that it's appropriate for and others that it's not. Um, uh, so it has many advantages. I'm not going to go through this. Um, but they're, they're pretty obvious. It's good for, for the elderly and disabled because you don't have to go up and down all those steps. Uh, takes soil subsidence and rising sea level in stride because it can just keep going up. And if you need to extend the poles, that's not a difficult thing to do. Whereas extending your stilts is really an issue. Um, and it's really inexpensive. It's easy to do, people do it themselves. So, okay, so at LSU, before I went to Waterloo, uh, um, I built a prototype with my students and we tested it and uh, it tilted it with sand sandbags to demonstrate the buoyant stability, and it worked beautifully. Um, and then FEMA found out about it and wrote LSU a letter, and LSU tore it down, and I was on my way to Waterloo anyway. Um, but I continued to work with the principals and applied them to um, a house in New Orleans. And this is not a photograph. Um, this is a lovely render that my architecture students do. They're very good at this kind of thing. Um, so here's an animation uh, that shows the assembly process. So I typically um, like develop this for the Louisiana shotgun house, which is this long, skinny sort of railroad car type of house. So we jack it up a little bit, put the structural subframe underneath it at the buoyancy blocks. The screen around it is to keep waterborne debris from settling underneath. And for the aesthetic issues, it has a telescopic vertical guidance post. So it's a sleeve within a sleeve, like the old-fashioned car antenna. And as the house goes up, it uh, um, pulls the... Uh, oh. What did I do? Sorry, I'm sorry. That's advanced my cursor. Can you let's take it to the next slide, yeah? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so that's just a uh, uh, labeling of the, of the parts. Um, so the conclusion, why fight with the flood water when you can simply float on it? Um, so Louisiana is in a lot of difficulty. The red shows the expected land loss over the next 50 years. Louisiana currently loses land at the rate of a football field of area every 45 minutes. Um, so it's a bad situation. So I looked at one of the, the, the houses in um, New Orleans. New Orleans is here. Uh, Baton Rouge is over here somewhere. Um, and so looking at Leeville, which used to be, um, uh, uh, have quite a, quite a bit of land around it, and now it looks like this. So the dark is the water, and what's gray is what's left of the land. Um, and so uh, this is a little house, um, and uh, we looked at the house and figured out a system for amphibiating the house, very simple, um, and that's the uh, uh, exploded accident method drawing on the right. Um, 
looking at uh, Princeville in North Carolina, hit very badly by Hurricane Floyd in 1999, and then in uh, 2016, uh, hit uh, again uh, very badly by uh, Hurricane Matthew. And Princeville is a critically important cultural heritage site because it was the very first town incorporated by freed slaves um, after the emancipation, after the, the Civil War. Um, and so after the second flood, after Matthew, um, uh, FEMA's solution is to move the community. Well, people don't, but we know what happens when that happens. So this was Hurricane Floyd, that's Floyd. Uh, and this is the building that I'm most interested in amphibiating in Princeville. It's the um, Primitive Baptist Church, uh, built in um, 1896. And uh, so that's my photograph. This is the interior with after being gutted. Uh, and here's an animation that shows what would happen if it were not amphibiated. Um, d damage up to that level, and then what do we need to do? Well, the crawl space under this isn't enough, so we need to raise the wall uh, uh, a little bit, and then drop in the buoyancy elements. Those are prefabricated dock floats, uh, put in the vertical guidance posts inside, in the corners, uh, and the framing, and put everything back together. Uh, now add water, and there's no problems. Uh, I'm going to skip this. This is the, the Heritage Museum. It used to be a school, another building uh, that I would be interested in amphibiating uh, in Princeville. But, uh, so this is the one that has the vertical guidance posts in the back, the facade where that nobody sees, uh, borrowing from uh, Buddy Blaylock's solution in Old River Landing. Uh, yeah. So the Farnsworth House in Plano, Illinois. Um, a monument of modern architecture from the early 50s. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe is the architect. In a floodplain, this was happening too frequently and the floods were getting higher. Uh, and so they've been having a lot of difficulty. And so we came up with a scheme for amphibiating the Farnsworth house. The key element of the Farnsworth is that it's already raised above the ground and you can see through underneath. So you have to maintain that clear space underneath. So we're putting the buoyancy elements um, in a pit underneath that's hidden uh, by a ground-like surface. And we bring the house back down and add water. and bring it back down. And this is the first example where I told my students when it comes down, that uh, entrance platform is not pristine white. It's mud. There's mud everywhere. So we have to go back and model the mud in these. So Vietnam is where I'm working on a project now. And this certainly is not heritage structure. This is, this is entirely vernacular. Um, but it's really interesting. So this is what the houses typically look like. So I got a grant um, to uh, 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 amphibiate the um, houses of the of rice farmers in the Mekong Delta. So that's what I'm working on. And uh, this is what the houses typically look like. The front is on the edge of the road. The roads are the dikes along the canals, and then the back of the house is on stilts. In, and uh, this is a typical house. Um, this is the one that we built in the rice field so that it would be low down, so that we knew that it would flood, and uh, so that we'd be able to have uh, get data, because most of the houses are elevated enough that they flood occasionally, but we need to have uh, proof of concept. So we're uh, floating it with um, uh, recycled jugs, uh, and uh, this is completed with uh, sleeves made out of rope, um, uh, this uh, three doors down, the now is the owner of the first house. Uh, this is his younger brother, Lack, and Lack asked us if we would move his house into the edge of the rice field and amphibiate it because they're going to um, improve the road and make all of the houses move off the road. So we agreed to do that. That's Lack's house completed. And lo and behold, two and a half weeks ago, the flooding came early and I started getting these photographs from my Vietnamese partners. And these houses are floating. 
now. That's that's Lack's house. And that's a house nearby that's not amphibiated. So this is what's happening in Vietnam now. Uh, and uh, this is a project in Canada, um, a pavilion as proof of concept and demonstration for First Nations uh, to see if they think this idea could possibly be appropriate for their communities. Um, and so we built this uh, um, superstructure in the uh, courtyard behind the School of Architecture in April uh, in modular pieces so we can take it apart and we'll move that to um, the uh, main campus um, uh, to a pond on the Waterloo campus and we're set to build uh, and do that installation in the um, beginning of October. Uh, in, in three weeks. Uh, and this is the last project I'm showing. It's uh, brand new. I was just approached about this um, about a week and a half ago. And it's the Washington Canoe Club. Um, anybody who is familiar with Washington, D.C., this is on the Potomac River. It's an um, iconic building. Uh, it's very large. Um, but it is, it is doable, I, I believe. I've been assessing it. Um, so here's the site plan. Uh, uh, this is Washington, D.C. It's right here on the Potomac River there and in an early site plan. Uh, there it is with the canal behind and the Potomac River there. So good access uh, to the river for canoes, um, uh, a floor plan. And this is what's important, going underneath and seeing that the original structure is intact and it's been shored up uh, with steel in a way that is conducive to this sort of retrofit. Um, so uh, in, uh, in all its glory, uh, I want to tell you that we've had two international conferences on amphibious architecture, design, and engineering. The first one was in Bangkok in 2015. Uh, the second one I hosted at the University of Waterloo uh, last summer, and the third one will be next summer at the BRE, Building Research Establishment in Watford, UK, just outside of London. Um, and again, it'll be at the end of June uh, in 2019. And we're going to hold IP 2021 in uh, Vietnam. And these are my sponsors, and thank you very much.